Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. As we record this episode for broadcast, the United Nations has begun a two-day general debate on the Security Council's new resolutions on Iraqi disarmament. At issue is how forceful the United Nations wants to be in enforcing disarmament and other Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. Specifically, does the United Nations want to engage in military action against Iraq? The United States, a member of the 15 Nations Security Council, is calling for a policy that will result in regime change in Iraq if the current regime does not meet all of the United Nations demands. In his September 12, 2002 speech to the UN General Assembly, George W. Bush stated, If Iraq's regime defies us again, the world must move deliberately, decisively, to hold Iraq to account. We will work with the UN Security Council for the necessary resolutions but the purposes of the United States should not be doubted. The Security Council resolutions will be enforced. The just demands of peace and security will be met, or action will be unavoidable. And a regime that has lost its legitimacy will also lose its power. Regime change is not allowed as policy according to the United Nations Charter. There is considerable resistance to taking the United Nations as far as the United States wants to go. Central to all of this seems to be the future credibility of the United Nations. United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan summed up the opportunity before the UN in a recent statement. Quote, if we handled this properly, we may actually strengthen international cooperation the rule of law, and the United Nations, enabling it to move forward in a purposeful way, not only in this immediate crisis, but in the future as well." Close quote. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress passed a resolution last week giving George W. Bush sweeping authority to use force in Iraq to, quote, defend the national security of the United States, close quote, and to, quote, enforce all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq, close quote. It should be noted, since it has not been noted by any of the corporate news agencies, to the best of our knowledge, that the resolution that the U.S. Congress passed did not go as far as Bush had asked. Bush wanted authorization to use all means that the President, quote, determines to be appropriate, including force, in order to enforce the United Nations Security Council resolutions referenced above, defend the national security interests of the United States against the threat posed by Iraq, and restore international peace and security in the region, close quote. What Bush got was a resolution that required the President to report to Congress prior to use of any force if possible. If not possible, the President must report to Congress no later than 48 hours after any military engagement and must justify his actions on the basis of it having been a last resort after all diplomatic attempts had been exhausted. This is not the blank check for which Bush had hoped, no matter how it is being spun in the corporate press after the fact. But even with congressional accountability, the United States is moving closer to a war with Iraq, with or without the United Nations' approval. Protests against any war with Iraq have grown worldwide. Earlier this month, nearly a half million people hit the streets in London, England, protesting Great Britain's support of the war effort. Elections in Germany were essentially determined on the basis of the party support or opposition to the impending war, with those favoring opposition being elected. Anti-war organizations can be found all over the Internet, 
calling for a peaceful means to disarm Iraq and to avoid war. It has been said that politics makes strange bedfellows. Former UN Chief Weapons Inspector Scott Ritter is a strange bedfellow of the anti-war movement. He is a proud ex-Marine intelligence officer and a self-described policeman. Unlike many of those who come to listen to his lectures on Iraq, he is not anti-war. He has stated unequivocally that he would serve in what he terms a legal war. He declares himself a faithful Republican and while not happy with the current president, he admits to having voted for him in the last election. So why did nearly 1,500 people turn out earlier this month in Victoria to hear what Scott Ritter had to say? Why is he invited to speak all over the world, including to the half million who met in England? How do some people's messages get heard, respected, and heeded from the many voices available to hear, respect, and heed? There are certainly political answers to these questions. There are certainly psychological answers to these questions. In today's episode of First Person Plural, we will examine a sociological perspective on the case of Scott Ritter. Essentially, Scott Ritter is making social problems claims. He is suggesting that there are problems with the ways in which the United States government is handling the Iraq situation. In addition, he is claiming that social action is needed to solve the problems he is identifying. Sociologist Donnelly Lisecki, in her book Thinking About Social Problems, offers an excellent framework upon which to examine social problems claims such as Scott Ritter's. It is her framework that we will be using this hour as we look at what Scott Ritter had to say during his visit to Victoria in an episode we call A War of Words. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Lisecki's approach to understanding a social problem is to understand the process by which a claim is made, received, accepted, and implemented into social action. What makes a claim powerful enough to draw crowds and media attention is the focus of Lisecki's perspective. We are not going to be concerned during this hour with how truthful Ritter's claims are. We have our opinions on the United States policies and on Ritter's claims. These opinions are not the focus of today's show. Instead, we hope to share with you how we came to believe what we believe about Ritter's claims and to help you see how he is making his claims well known and legitimated. Lusecki begins with claims makers, the people who say and do things to convince audiences that a social problem is at hand. Social problems claims are made all the time. Just sitting around the donut shop with friends, one is bound to make a dozen claims about what is wrong with the world and how it might be fixed. However, Ritter isn't sitting around the donut shop. He is on an active international campaign and seems to be gaining support for his point of view. So what is it about Scott Ritter that makes his claims more legitimate? Several possibilities are available when we think about a claims maker. Some claims makers speak with the authority of status. 
Certainly, George W. Bush's claims about Iraq are heeded simply because of the position he holds in his society. Depending upon the claim, physicians, scientists, and other designated experts are often afforded more credibility. Organizational backing also creates attention as spokespersons representing specific organizations often carry more authority than individuals. Celebrities who already have our attention often make social problems claims that are given more weight than those by the average citizen are given. Perceived motives also give credence to claims. Claims made by those who would profit from the solution are regarded as less credible than those that seem to be born from altruism. In a press conference before his lecture, attended mostly by CFUV's spoken word broadcasters, we asked Scott Ritter why he was traveling around the world giving lectures. I was really happy I got the question of why are you doing what you're doing posed to him during that press conference. It actually was the last question of the press conference, if I remember right. I thought that his answer was very telling. He was reliant upon both his position and his motive to legitimize his claim. His position as a UN inspector, his position as a former U.S. Marine were very prominent in his answer. So was the fact that he was willing to die for his country. He kind of left one wondering what he's getting out of this other than just doing his duty. Well, invariably, that's a catch-22. If you have no motive to be doing what you're doing, that makes you suspect. But if you have a motive to be doing what you're doing, that makes you suspect, too. Moreover, indicating that you might possibly know what you're talking about, in the specific case, he really was in Iraq, he really was a UN weapons inspector, isn't necessarily, quote, argument from authority, close quote. He is standing up and saying, look, this is who I am, and this is what I've seen, and this is why I'm doing it. I do think that he left a couple of things out in his answer. It's stuff that he addressed in other places, mind you. I'm just referring to the answer at the press conference right now. He leaves out the fact that he's a whistleblower. In 1998, the reason that he resigned is he was upset with the fact that the CIA had taken over his operations in Iraq and were, in fact, using it for spying, trying to get information that would help them topple the Hussein government. And he walked out on it. He said, I will have no part of this. And he quit. That puts him in the role of a whistleblower. I mean, he turned around then and went to Congress and said, look what happened. And then he started doing lectures back in 98. He's getting a lot more airtime now, but that's the role he's been playing. I also wonder if he doesn't have some ulterior motive regarding the recognition of his work. Essentially, what these leaders are getting up and doing are saying, hey, in 1991 they had weapons, so they must have it today. And he spent six years of his life making sure that they didn't. So right away they're impugning his credibility. And, and the quality of his work, not just his credibility, but the very thing that he did. They're saying, no, Scott Ritter, you didn't do a good job. And I think that he does have 
an ulterior motive that he doesn't speak of often, of standing up and saying, you know, damn it, I did do a good job. We went in there and we got rid of a whole bunch of nasty things. I don't think he seriously questions whether anyone believes that he enjoys having his work impugned. And, and I don't know whether it undermines his credibility or not, but it certainly is something that he's not using to increase his credibility. Losecki suggests that the making of a social claim is the constructing of a morality. A social problems claim is a claim to what the right thing to do should be. This morality argument is based upon not only how legitimate the maker of the claim is, but also upon how well the claims maker convinces his or her audience that the claim is justified morally. This can be through the evoking of shared values such as religious, organizational, or humanitarian moralities. Ritter is essentially making two claims. One, the United States is violating international and constitutional law by advocating and working towards regime change in Iraq. Two, the United States is starting on this path because certain members of the government are intent upon unilateral American world domination, what he calls American imperialism. I thought that Lusecki's concepts were easily applicable to what Ritter is doing, probably because Ritter is being very rational about the arguments that he's making. Sometimes when you look at claims makers, it's hard to see their rationality. 
Ritter, however, is very articulate and very reasonable in the way that he presents his argument. And as such, it makes it very easy to identify the moralities, to use Lasecki's terms, that he's reliant upon. Let me clarify that before you go any further. You speak of moralities in Lasecki's work. Does that mean absolute claims to ethical conduct, or is she constructing something else with the word? What she means by the word is people, in order to make a social problems claim, a social problems claims maker has to tell you what is right and what is wrong. They have to clarify within the text of their claim what is right and what is wrong. So she's talking not so much about what is really right and really wrong, but what they construct as right and wrong. And she divides it up into three possibilities. And one of them is that kind of absolutism where you have religious claims that, you know, say God says that this is the way it should be or our ancestors have taught us this is the way it should be, and so forth. But she also allows for what she calls organizational and humanitarian claims. These are a little more gray area claims. They, they are arguments that are based upon reasonable assumptions that are presented within the argument. So it's not assuming something outside the box. So it's, it means prescriptive. Yes, they are being prescriptive. That's the whole point of making the claim. It's saying this is bad, this is wrong, and this is what you have to do to make it better. And the claim has both of those elements in it. So the claim is, is saying this is a problem because, and here is a solution because. Okay, I understand. Okay. So Ritter is making some very specific claims. And he's saying that this is bad because it's a violation of law, it's a violation of international relationships, it is anti-democratic, and he, you know, really strikes a chord when he talks about it being imperialistic. And he's basically saying this is why it's bad. This is why a unilateral war with Iraq without approval from the UN Security Council is a violation of law, and it's a violation of democratic principles. And so he's making, for the most part, organizational claims. For the most part, he's saying, look, we have this constitution, we have this UN charter, we have laws that we abide by. This is the right thing to do, to abide by these laws. He's saying that Bush and the other people who are supporting Bush in this effort are, in fact, violating these laws. And that that is bad. Yes. He's making the claim that it is, in fact, bad. He's not saying they're violating the laws, but that's okay because they are the law. Or, but that's okay because if they don't really want to, they're not bound by it. He's saying there's no getting around obeying the law. Sure. In the press conference... He's marking rule of law as the bedrock of the argument. Yeah, in the press conference, he was asked about a debate that he had with his former boss, and he responded, I'm holding you as an American accountable the same way that I'm holding Iraq accountable. Everyone is accountable to the law. And that's a basic premise upon which he's making his claims. That's the basic morality that he's appealing to. The problem is, is that I think he's kind of naive in his discussions of this. He sort of forgets a little bit of American history when he's presenting this. It's kind of hard to talk about the U.S. government respecting international law up until this incident of unilateralism when you look at two things. One, the U.S. government has failed to, up until this point, ratify the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it also has failed to support the world court. And this makes one suspect of their intention all along to abide by international law. Or indeed, a grasp of rule of law at all. Sure, you wonder what they're up to. I mean, you wonder if they're not willing to talk about basic human rights and agree to basic human rights, especially since... Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the authors of the um, UN 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then if you wonder, you know, why they won't go to the world court, what ulterior motives do they have? I mean, they're already suspect, I guess, is what I'm saying is they're already suspect in the international community. The other thing is that he talks about American imperialism like this is a brand new thing, and I think that if you were to interview a few Native folk, and that's not even looking at, you know, different foreign policies that are suspect in American history. He paints the United States as being a basic good guy nation up until this point. It serves his claims making well to do that. It makes him vulnerable as well. As does a rather obvious logical flaw. He's annoyed at the Americans for not respecting rule of law and he considers that as you pointed out to be the absolute in his argument, the, uh, the basis of the ethical recommendation. The Americans, being unilateralists, contest that very point. So right away, he can't convince them. And I can tell that that frustrates him, but from a strictly, quote, logical, close quote, standpoint, he has no argument. Mm -hmm. Social claims only work in general if the person to whom the claim is made respects the bedrock principles, while the second would call the moralities of the argument. So there's a bit of a catch-22. Losecki suggests that once a moral base is constructed, strategies for claims making need to be adopted. How moralities are evoked can be seen as the strategy that a claims maker uses to get the claim heard by a social audience. The claim is not just made, it is made in a way that evokes a response, else it is never heard or heeded. Successful claims are successful in part because the best strategies were chosen. Strategies can include multiple approaches. Strategies must consider competing claims and address these claims. Strategies must consider the audience, including mass media coverage. Ritter has testified before governmental bodies. He has lectured before crowds on all seven continents. He has been interviewed by news agencies all over the world. He has had public debates on major networks. He has written books and authored articles for major news agencies. The content of Ritter's claims have remained essentially consistent throughout all these media with a list of eyewitness accounts and political analyses of what he has seen and experienced.
to really get the flavor of his strategies, you kind of have to listen to the entire lecture. The soundbite that we picked is a good example of, but it certainly is not all-inclusive of his argument. I've read some transcripts and listened to some interviews. I mean, one of the things is the cop metaphor. He used it uh, several times during his lecture. I think that it's a nice little metaphor for him to use. It's, it's sort of like he's talking to the law and order generation, and they're going to understand this metaphor because, you know, they all sit around and watch law and order and wish for this perfect world in which cops do this wonderful job. It makes his work more accessible. Well, it provides a metaphor for his work that he considers an accessible one and may consider an accurate one as well. When he's describing how he took the Iraqis and put them in different rooms and kind of played uh, played them off of each other, like, you know, he would go into one room and say, so-and-so in the other room told me about such-and-such, -such, and he would trick them into telling them about where a weapon was. That seemed very real to me for some reason. It made me feel like I understood what he did a lot better than hearing, well, we can't talk about this because of national security interests or, you know, all the crap that you get. You think it provided verisimilitude? Yeah, I, it was a story that I bought. I mean, when I think of it, I have no idea whether it's true or not, but it seemed true. And I, and I think that that leads to one of the things that I really like about his approach. He seems to be giving out a lot more information than most people who talk about foreign relations and weapons inspection and so forth give out. I mean, on The Daily Show, he had John Stewart totally fascinated with the whole process. And that was probably the first exposure I had to this. And I was like sitting there going, wow, I never thought about that before. I never thought about what you go about doing. You know, it was just always this sort of vague concept before, oh, disarmament. Well, you go, you find the bombs, you blow them up. The drawback, of course, is that details are the mark of a good con artist. It's something that he would do if he were serious about getting people to believe him. It's also something he would do if he were serious about getting people to believe him, given that he wasn't telling the truth, given that he was a mole for whomever or for whatever. But I think Michael Moore is a good comparison. He started with nothing as well. Ritter started with a little more than that. But they both just started doing what they wanted to do in terms of turning out text. Moore's text was film. Ritter's is... Lectures. Yes, His and words. books yeah. and other media, if I may call them that. It's interesting that you compare the two because they both have the same publicist. Do they? Yeah. I think that it's interesting that he's doing the... You talk about lectures and books and so forth. And I was thinking about, you know, there are other ways that he could be presenting his message. And certainly if you take a look at what George Bush is doing, showing up in front of cameras with you know, special backgrounds behind him and always the American flag around and having, you know, pretty pictures taken of him with world leaders. And I mean, he's obviously doing a kind of Madison Avenue approach without giving you very much information. Ritter, like Moore, on the other hand, likes to go and talk to college people and, and uh, do personal in-depth interviews and engage in debates and so forth. And it's kind of almost like an intellectual circuit that he's on, sort of the activists and the intellectuals. And he goes about doing it without doing too much to look like he's Madison Avenue, in spite of the fact that he, both of them, both Moore and Ritter, have a publicist. They have somebody who arranges public relations for them has somebody who, you know, helps them create an image. But you don't get that sense of it. You don't get a sense that they're creating an image. The image that they're creating is a kind of intellectual, sincere image instead of a soundbite spin image. The point I'm trying to make is that you can't really assess their veracity. What you can do is note what they have to say or not note it. And particularly, you may do so in the future based on what you have heard from them in the past. I really have no idea if there are weapons of mass destruction or trivial destruction or spontaneous generation or any other sort of weapons in Iraq. What would the opposite of mass destruction be? I guess 
I've often wondered what a limited war is. I'm old enough to remember Vietnam, at least that well. But the point is, under postmodernism, one no longer believes anything. One notes it, does not note it, compares it to other text, and so forth. Sure, and what we're talking about right now is legitimation strategies. And the two are somewhat compatible and somewhat incompatible. I guess the only other thing that I might want to mention at this point is that it surprises me that he doesn't make more of the whistleblower thing. I mentioned that earlier, talking about him as a claims maker. But the CIA involvement, he talks about it some, and he talks about it not so much in terms of who he is, but in terms of how wrong it is. He actually is making moral claims about the CIA taking over the inspections. And I think that that is an interesting strategy, especially in international audiences, because he, well, it's a thing that worries me about his safety. I mean, I sometimes feel like if he gets up and says it's too much, the next thing you're going to hear about is that he died in a plane accident under mysterious circumstances or something. I, I am amazed that he has done the kind of whistleblowing that he's done. It's the thing that worries me, contradicting what I said less than two minutes ago, about his credibility. Does he really not expect people from countries other than the United States to say CIA, USMC, NSC, you all look the same to me? Does he really think that someone from Iraq, for example, is going to draw a distinction between the Marine Corps and the CIA because the Americans tell them to? I don't know. I bought that. I bought that they knew the difference, that they understood that the, in, that the UN inspectors were gathering information for one reason, and then they started figuring out that the CIA was gathering it for another. Yeah, I suppose in the specific case, that makes sense. But one of the things about the Native Holocaust was that the Caucasians considered that's not my department to be a specific and definitive argument in every case. They said, no, no, that's the Bureau of Indian Affairs' problem. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs would say, no, no, that's the Justice Department's problem. And Justice would say, no, no, that's the Army. And they'd just give the natives the runaround on these particular issues. And at times, it looked as if they were doing it deliberately. Wouldn't it have been a surprise to find out that it was deliberate? Hardware says it's software. Software says it's hardware. Who are you kidding? Yeah. But I think that the argument he's making is not so much that it was because it was the CIA, but rather it was because what the CIA was using the information for, that that was the violation of law. And again, you know, it's a moral claim that he's making. It doesn't matter what, whether they were getting away with it in Iraq or not. What mattered is they were violating law by doing it, and he holds the CIA accountable to the law. Yes, he was quite clear on that point. The point he was not clear on was enforcement. If the CIA breaks the law, who's going to do anything about it? And he can say, well, other police agencies and agencies that aren't called police agencies but still are. But in practice, police agencies and agencies that aren't called police agencies but still are show a great reluctance to interfere with each other's livelihood. And thus, a whistleblower is needed. And that's why I think of him more than anything else as a whistleblower. You're listening to First Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using its phallocentric organ. The corporate media to control ordinary people like you and me. In order to be successful, a claims maker must assess who his or her audience is and construct a vision of the audience for the audience. Because the problem is being approached as a social problem, it requires an understanding of a social response. To do this, claims makers have to construct particular kinds of conditions affecting particular kinds of people. Conditions include the frequency, severity, and causes of the problems, as well as the efficacy and feasibility of the solutions. The people are villains, victims, or good guys. It is not sufficient to convince an audience that there is a problem. 
The claim is about a solution to the problem. The claim is also about what the audience can do to affect the solution. Ritter has an international audience that has run the gamut from government officials to anarchistic protesters. In order for his claims to be successful, he must convince this wide range of people that they have a part to play in stopping American imperialism. Clearly, his villain is George W. Bush and Bush's cronies who seem bent on world domination. Saddam Hussein is also a villain. The victims are the Iraqi people, Americans who stand for democracy, and members of the international community interested in a peaceful and secure world. The good guys are the United Nations and those who support international law. Where does the audience, in this case a Canadian audience, fit into Ritter's claims making? There's some question in my mind as to whether Ritter knew to whom he was speaking at the press conference and at the lecture. He didn't seem to get what Canadians were all about. I don't either, but I think I get it better than he did. The My Country Right or Wrong routine does not really go over well here, and he wasn't exactly to that point. But he still had this sort of little buddy attitude toward Canada. The big uh, guy who hasn't been put in the special class yet in elementary school who has decided that you're his friend and you dare not contradict him. Because he's going to hug you to death. <laughs> yeah, sometimes he hugs just a little bit too hard. Yeah, there's a couple of places that he missed the boat. Um, in, in contrast to the soundbite that we played, it was interesting during the press conference that he did say at one point, I think in response to a question you asked him about reciprocity on arms inspections, that the United States had a moral standing in the world that allowed them to be beyond scrutiny. My question was whether the United States would accept reciprocal inspections, that is, would they accept the UN coming in and inspecting their weapons if the UN determined that they had committed human rights violations or other international crimes? He, he said the UN and the rest of the nations in the Security Council formed a cartel right after the Second World War. Get used to it. Yeah, he said that there were five nations with special status, and the United States was one of them. I think that what he was trying to do was be very practical in his response. 
I mean, he even began his remarks with, it's going to be theoretical. We could talk about it, but it's theoretical because the reality is the U.S. is never going to let it happen. It's an interesting contrast because in the speech, what he was talking about was, you have to be the friend who takes away the keys from the, from the drunk who's driving. But he essentially said in the press conference, any way that we have to take these keys away have very little bite if the United States just decides that they don't want the keys taken away. That at some point, there is no way to stop them. But that response makes a joke of the notion of rule of law. Unilateralism means supersession of rule of law by a given party. Yes. They are logically inconsistent. They are mutually exclusive. Ritter apparently didn't get that unless he was being sarcastic or playing devil's advocate. I think he thought of himself as a realist at that point. I don't think he was comfortable with the answer, the U.S. can do what they want. But I think that he was saying, look, there's going to be a limit to what you can do. What was interesting is he didn't bring that up in his, discuss in his direct address to Canadians. You know, he said basically you can be a good example and you can push your leaders to do certain things to kind of shame the United States into being better people. But he didn't bring out what he brought out in the press conference when he was questioned. And that is that at some point, the United States citizenry is going to have to reel their own government in. He quoted the American Constitution, or I should say referenced the American Constitution in the name of authoritative argument. I don't think he's figured out that Canadians don't really feel bound by the American Constitution. And the drug driving metaphor might have been ill-timed as well. He got a good laugh by pointing out that the United States has a drunk at the wheel right now. But the whole drunk driving campaign was contextualized differently in the United States. They'd never really been comfortable with alcohol. The country borders on being a theocracy as it is, and they drink, but they never feel entirely good about it. Compare with Canada, where everyone drinks all the time, at least to my American perceptions. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we see a lot of behavior up here that we know our American friends would describe as alcoholic behavior, as in pathological. And yet, we also note that Canadians rarely regard it as pathological. And they will drink not just beer, as the stereotypes suggest, but anything with alcohol in it. It's like Australian North. Now, that is my perception of the situation. But the point is this. In Canada, drunk driving is perhaps criminal, in any case actionable. But to an American audience, it would be just plain immoral in absolute terms. And I think Ritter was counting on that construction. Of the immorality. Yes, when he made the rhetorical appeal. Yes. When he made the joke about George W. Bush being the drunk at the wheel. And I don't think the Canadians saw it that way at all. So it was, it was a miscalculation. We hope this analysis will help you to sort through the war of words surrounding the U.S.-Iraqi situation. Ritter is, of course, only one claims maker catching the interest of audiences around the world. We hope that you will think critically about all the claims that are being made at this most dangerous time. We want to encourage you not to take our word for it. You can hear the full lecture presented by Scott Ritter from the internet at the URL www.uvss.uvic.ca slash a w u slash that url again is www.uvss.uvic.ca slash a w u slash you can find a link to a recording of the scott ritter victoria press conference by visiting our website at culturalconstructioncompany.com Go to the CCC radio shows and then to the link for first person plural, then link to this week's episode, which is number 22. We hope you will stay as informed as you can and will encourage our leadership to do the same. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week.
have been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.